adrift in the vast Atlantic, the Faroe Islands, my final landfall. It takes at least 12 hours to get here by boat, so I've taken the express route to the Faroes by plane. What a way to catch my first glimpse of these mystical islands. That is the Lord of the Rings. It's Middle Earth. The Faroes are 18 separate islands with nearly 700 miles of coastline, home to fewer than 50,000 people who are never more than three miles from the sea. The landscape's staggeringly beautiful. Sheer cliffs, rugged mountains and stunning sea stacks. It's not surprising then that landing on these islands is pretty hair-raising. The gateway to the Faroe Islands is this tiny strip of tarmac and an airport many believed could never be built in such wild terrain. Handling boats is a part of everyday life here, but there's one day a year when the Faroese really get to show their mettle. The national holiday, St Olaf's Day, July 29th. The rowing races are the highlight of the festival, with pride and prizes at stake, and the whole town turns out to watch. Well, if they can peer through the sea mist. My name is Runa, and I'm the captain for the girls' rowing team uh, for Toshan Rowing Club. Smile. <laughs> we always eat together uh, before the race. If we lose or if we win, it's exciting no matter what. So. If we win uh, this race and the championship, we got four trophies. <laughs> yeah, we're going out after the race. <laughs> it's a party. <laughs> it's a boat for six rowers, and it's a traditional Faroese boat. Uh, and in the competition, it's the smallest. You also have boats for eight or ten persons. Champions are triumphant again. They celebrate their win in a way that's familiar the world over. Youngsters who practice their English watching satellite TV. The pharaohs are remote, but not isolated. But connections with the original Viking settlers are never far away. And the seafarers who arrived here in 800 AD struggled to make a home on these barren, unforgiving rocks. Clinging to the coast for food and transport, slowly settlements were established. Something is striking about many of the houses here today. Camouflaged under a layer of turf, these dwellings reveal their age-old origins. And this house has been lived in by the same family for 17 generations. Parts of it date back to the end of the Viking era. Johannes Patterson is the current resident. The thing I notice right away about the outside is the grass roof. Grass on top of the roofs, yeah, grass on top of the houses, which is a, which is a very common way of building houses in the Paris. You have an abundance of grass all around. And when you then put the grass on top, you would have a, also a very quiet house, fairly well insulated house. And also the weight of the grass, you might say, hold the roof on top during winter storms. Come inside. OK. Take a look in the kitchen. All right. Yeah, come, well, come inside. They may have had an abundance of grass, but with no trees on the island, wood was in short supply. 
the ancient timber in this house had to come hundreds of miles across the sea from Norway. The house itself arrived here in late year 1000, probably, and came as a prefabricated house from Norway. Oh, really? So they were doing flat pack? Oh, yeah, they, they built it on location. They only had probably the sails to transport, so it was very important to them that they didn't transport more than necessary, but everything necessary in order to have a finished house once they arrived at its oh. destination. Up through this door here, takes us about 900 years back in time. No, no way. Uh, um, so this has been standing for a thousand years? Yeah, close to it, yeah. How does it feel? and knowing that your family have been living here generation after generation since 1557. I, don't I mean, talk about a family home. Yeah, definitely it's a family home, and most of their lives have been lived in this room. I've always lived here, so it's not something you go, go around thinking about all the time, but it is, of course, it is special also for us, and uh, yeah, it's a privilege. Yeah. We feel it's a privilege. the privilege of being an island people. And for over a thousand years, the Faroese have toiled hard just to cling on to this precarious land. The daily chore of getting enough to eat, the isolation yet kinship of a tiny group of islands so far from the rest of the world. This really is life on the edge. If you've got a romantic idea about island life, then a visit to the Faroe Islands especially on a day like today, with the rain and the low cloud and the mist, then you get a sense of the bigger picture. It is starkly beautiful, but it's a struggle as well. There is a good life to be had here, but it's a life made of tough decisions, hard choices. It's about being pragmatic. And perhaps more than anything else, it's about being prepared to take full advantage of everything that the land and the sea and the sky have to offer.